the previous lifetime he saw, which was in, I think the year was about 1800, and he saw that he was a soldier, the father. The father was a soldier in like Turkey or some place like that. How have you seen karma operate uh, through relationships after one has undergone past life regression? Her daughter had autism. And when she came for the session, what she saw was very interesting. She saw that she was a mother of a five-year-old boy and living somewhere in Europe. The brother in the current lifetime is a woman again. And he is also paying for the fact that, you know, I have to suffer because I was not able to look after my wife. Till the age of 35, he was carrying this prarabdh. And he was in this cycle, this karmic cycle. But at 35, God said, okay, now enough. Now you are going to fall so madly in love that you're going to have to leave behind this that you're carrying and begin your new life. Can we also know karmic impediment or the relationship factor between, say, a a husband and wife, maybe a mother-in-law and a daughter-in-law. I want to also touch upon siblings or father and son. Hi, I'm Pritika Rao. I'm an actor from Mumbai, India. Welcome to my podcast. I bring to you astrology podcasts and spiritual podcasts. And I introduce you to the best of people in the esoteric world. Today, I have with me Dr. Tripti Jain, who is a past life regression therapist and an authentic one. And that's my endeavor. A welcome on my podcast. Thank you, Pritika. I have to begin by telling you, I was such a big fan of that show, Raj Pichle Janamka. Ma'am actually did live past life regression on the set, you know, and got people in their past life. I'm very keen to know about this. What was that experience of doing live past life regression on a set? You know, um, I'm basically a psychologist, right? So I worked in a mental health facility for 25, 30 years. And for me, my little clinic room was like my shrine. So I never thought the work that I do in a, in a room is going to be out on a set. Um, so what really happened was in uh, 2009, uh, January or February, my school friend, okay, Sudipta Basu, called me up and said she's going through some problems, so can she come and do a session with me? So I said, yeah, sure. And then, of course, she came for her sessions, and post the session, she felt that it really helped her. And at that time, she started a small, you know, like a media company. And uh, she thought that uh, why not do like past life regression sessions on television? So, of course, I was not for it. I thought it was like not possible. It's like so confidential. Why would somebody come on TV, you know? But she insisted. And uh, then, of course, you know, everything got rolling. Post that, uh, three months uh, was when we entertained calls from people who wanted to come on the show. And we got like 10 lakh people calling in at the call center. And um, it was crazy, absolutely crazy. What was the reaction of, you know, the people on the set seeing you do live past life regression out there? So I would have the content creative team coming to me um, after the session got over. And they would say like, uh, ma'am, what did you just do? <laughs> you know, and they would say, ma'am, you are a magician, you know, all kinds of things like that. And I myself was amazed because... You know, every day I would be doing two sessions, three hours, four hours, and again, four hours. And I wouldn't be tired. And I would like amazed at myself, like what is going on? But I think there is some divine force that works, especially in shows like this. Absolutely. I, I totally agree. Um, I have to uh, tell my audience here, one of my actor friends had clearly seen her past life during a regression. And... She compelled me, like you, the rather not compelled, um, inspired me or influenced me to go and get a session done. I did not see anything, but she has. So I believe in uh, the authenticity of this entire science. Um, but I want to know from you, how do you differentiate between people who are, you know, uh, just fascinated by the concept of seeing their past life and 
probably are not really getting into that space where they're actually seeing their past life. They're just imagining it. How do you differentiate? See, it's important to understand there's something called past life visitation that people want. Oh, I want to see my past life. So like you said that, you know, you went inspired by your friend to do a past life session and nothing really happened. But the key is, why did you go? Did you have a problem? Did you have an issue? Did you want to investigate something specific like a relationship or health? Nothing, right? So where is your consciousness going to take you? Because you have nothing to investigate. So which folder is it going to open? It cannot open anything. Your friend who maybe had an issue or had a problem or she was wanting to know more about something is maybe the reason that she got an experience. So it's important, uh, Pritika, to understand you may have visual, um, like, you know, visuals coming to you, random visuals coming to you, or you may have, let's say, you know, hallucinations or drug-induced, okay, hallucinations. These are not past life memories or some dreams. Hmm. So there are many people who will tell me, you know, I have very vivid dreams, but I'm not, I'm, I'm not able to see a past life where it's visual. Because a dream is different and a past life experience is different. When you see a past life memory, what should be the consequence is important to understand. Some particular relationship that was not working before is suddenly working now. So there is some shift that has taken place. Okay. Then if you have had a true past life experience, then your thought process will start changing. So people will like call me after a month or month and a half and say, ma'am, pehle mein aise sochti thi, ab mein aise sochti hun. Can you give me some examples of, you know, karma and how have you seen karma operate uh, through relationships after one has undergone past life regression? Let me give you an example, um, various examples, but I'll give you a few of them to understand. She wanted to know why she has a special needs child. Her daughter had autism and when she came for the session, the daughter was about four or five years old. And what she saw was very interesting. She saw that she was a mother of a five-year-old boy and living somewhere in Europe. And the boy had high fever and she was not around at that time. She had gone to work and this boy got high fever and got fits. And before she could come home, the boy died. Now, when I told her, look at the boy, so generally we'll, re we'll recognize the soul through the eyes. So I told her that look at the boy, for the eyes were closed of the boy. But as she looked at the boy, she had a regret that she was not able to take care of her son. So in the current lifetime, the son is born as the daughter. Because in that lifetime, at the point of death, the boy suffered from seizures, it is possible that the soul of the daughter is carrying that trauma, which has manifested in actually autism. But now the mother is looking after the child. So karma is like that. What I'm unable to do, I am going to do it to that same child again. There, the boy is now the girl here. Wow. So this is how a mother-child relationship functions. And this is how actually karma becomes visible. I'll give you another very interesting example of a husband and wife. This very interesting lady had come to see me. Her husband had passed away about six, eight months ago. And she was going through a lot of depression and, you know, missing him and all that stuff. She told me that the husband suffered from bipolar in this lifetime. And also towards the end of his life, he got into addiction. Hmm. So he was like, you know, going through quite a messy kind of life. And they'd been married for nearly 10 years, but they never lived together together because she went abroad to do her uh, education and he was running a business here. So he couldn't go abroad and stuff like that. So she was disturbed, but she wanted to know why he had to leave so early. Now, in the past life, she saw that the husband was a decoit. Okay. And she was a village girl with living in a family. And this decoit came and killed her family and her. Now in the current lifetime, what is happening? How is karma coming up? Now in the current lifetime, they got married. With love, care and concern, both of them became intimate, right? But he had to pay for the sin that he has committed. And 
in the in that lifetime when she was dying he she told him that i want to see you suffer in front of me so in the current lifetime that's exactly what happened right he was suffering she was there to see him suffer and um, he developed so many conditions because he had to be punished for what he had already done so in the after the session of course she was very disturbed after the session because she did not anticipate something like this but later on you know she told herself that yes this is karma this is maybe why uh, the karma that she shared with her husband was extremely complex so a victim and a persecutor like she was a victim he was a persecutor so victim and persecutors can can get married okay and when they get married this is the reason because the victim has to forgive the persecutor and the persecutor has to suffer in front of the victim hmm so this is very complex karma have you seen cases of uh, you know repeated circumstances yeah it can happen like in a previous lifetime let's say an example can be given that so we call this a betrayer betrayed cycle so a betrays b okay then the next lifetime b betrays a third lifetime a betrays b again so you are in this betrayed betrayal cycle and it's very difficult to break this cycle unless one of the person steps out of it hmm so this, this is like a drama like i call it basically like a karmic drama that you are playing over and over again so is it forgiveness you have to forgive you have to have a lot of compassion that i can be a victim today but i have turned a persecutor in the next lifetime so it's like i i suffer then i make somebody else suffer then i suffer again for that mm. right so once you understand the cycle you are willing to get out of it wow it's fascinating how uh, karma operates and uh, past life is something that has been written you know since time in memorials in our vedas uh it's something that western world debated but i think it's pretty logical because the world is existing since so many thousands of years and we have a history of uh, urban living since like 10000 years at least in india so where were you if you're 18 right now and watching this show where were you 18 years back so it's just about logical that there is a past life and this is how karma functions so it's very fascinating to hear from you um can we also know the karmic impediment or the relationship factor between say a a husband and wife maybe a mother in law and a daughter in law i want to also touch upon siblings or father and son i'm fascinated to know how karma is operating in in a family so let us say father and son so i have a lot of people who come to see me to investigate death like death of their children especially less than the age of 18 or less than the age of 25 uh, parents get extremely worried about you know such early deaths so i had this father who came to see me in pune and uh, his son died in a bike accident so uh, it's very interesting how uh, death comes to people who are that young so this boy used to tell the the parents that i want a bike at that time he was maybe just turned 18 or something and they refused they said no we're not going to give you a bike because you know you're not listening to us and you may just take the bike and go around and you know whatever and have an accident so they refused to give him a bike so he used to take his friend's bike oh and then go around you know like and he used to live in pune so he used to go on the ghats the eventually the parents agreed that okay on your 19th birthday we'll give you a bike but you must listen to us so anyway they bought a bike and how destiny plays a role in uh, in life you know so uh, once they had decided that they want to go to the village for some work and all that so the uh, the father told his sister to come and spend the night with his son so that you know he doesn't uh, take the bike and go out in the night but you know knowing young boys um as his his bua went to sleep hmm. and uh, at about 12:31 or something he took his bike and he went to the ghats and crashed okay four days they couldn't find his body 
the father had an intuition somehow he said but i knew that they, they this is where we'll find the body somehow he had some intuition he told the cops and that's exactly where they found the body and they realized that there was no foul play because interestingly just outside the tunnel was a small shop which had a cctv camera okay and they that uh, accident had been captured in that so they were able to see it that he actually was r- riding it in full speed and he took a turn and the bike crashed so he wanted to know why this has happened to them so in a previous lifetime he saw which was in i think the year was about 1800 and he saw that he was a soldier the father the father was a soldier in like turkey or some place like that and um the king of that time uh wanted the soldier to kill his wife that means the soldier's wife was the king's sister okay and the king wanted to upset the property okay and there were some other problems that were being faced and so the king gave orders to the soldier that you have to kill your wife oh okay and the soldier had to follow the orders because he was promised property and money and stuff like that so he said it's okay you know i'll kill my wife i'll marry another wife and the wife is was the son in the current lifetime so he had to go through that trauma so i kill you right i have to pay so how will i pay either i'll get killed like this person will kill me if i'm in the betrayed betrayal cycle but if this person die as a son dies early think of the grief the father will go through much more then death can come to him right so sometimes this can also happen the person you love the most disappears and then you pay you just uh, live with sadness and depression this can happen to somebody also so this is another way of looking at losing your loved one yes absolutely hmm. like you spoke about sisters you know uh, siblings that's also very interesting to probe so there is this lady who came to see me she and her three sisters are all unmarried and she wanted to know what is the karma behind this and why are they not getting married so what she saw was very interesting she saw that she was a man who had a wife and a son and she this man had two sisters okay and the mother in the current lifetime the two sisters and the mother are the three sisters in this lifetime the lady saw the two sisters and the mother used to harass her a lot they used to really harass her so much that they didn't want the brother to be happy so they would be acting in cruel ways with this wife and because of that the wife died early oh okay now what has happened in the current lifetime the brother is one of the sisters and the three of them have also arrived as sisters and all the four are unmarried because the three sisters obviously have to pay for the fact that matrimony is not going to be for them they're going to suffer they will not get married and the the brother in the current lifetime is is a woman again and he is also paying for the fact that you know i have to suffer because i was not able to look after my wife mm. so i should also not get married so this is how sometimes siblings can come together in a lifetime suffering the same karma the same debt or the same regret or the same pain that you have caused others you will have to bear that pain again so as they say as you give you get hmm so if you give pain you get pain as simple as that this is very fascinating i also want to uh, ask you at this point does going back to a past life um somewhere i'm sure it it changes your frame of mind and perspective at looking at things but does it also uh, burn your sanchit karmas and prarabdhas and all of that so what is actually prarabdh karma that is what you carry in your current lifetime and sanchit karma is the accumulated karma like an ocean okay so when you carry prarabdh karma you're carrying certain lessons to learn and certain lessons that you have to 
finish or complete. So as you keep learning these lessons, obviously your prarab that you have carried from your past life will reduce. Okay. But the problem here is that because we don't know what we are carrying and the karma that we do on a daily basis also adds to the prarab. So you have your prarab, the karma, then you have the kriyaman karma, the karma that you're doing daily. Right. Okay. You also have what we call agami karma, money future karma that you're thinking about. Hmm. So let us say I have carried prarab the karma that I, I want to look after my parents and I have to be with them. In the kriyaman karma, the daily karma, I'm not being good to my parents. Right? I'm upset with them or I am um, you know, doing things which are displeasing them. Right? I'm also thinking agami karma in my thought process that, you know, I really do want to live with my parents. I just want to go away somewhere or something should happen to them. Some nonsense you're thinking of. Mm. So all this that you're doing and thinking is adding to your prarabdh. Okay. So though you have come to dissolve your prarabdh, you are unaware. Hmm. So all this will keep adding to it. So by the end of your life, maybe your prarab, instead of becoming a spoon of water, becomes a bucket of water. And that bucket is going to be added to your sanchitta karma. And that's one of the reasons you need multiple lifetimes to dissolve karmic lessons or to learn karmic lessons. So it's important that you become aware of your lessons. Past life therapy can help you to become aware of what is the lesson that you're carrying in your current lifetime. So that as you meditate and as you become more aware, your kriyaman karma, your daily karmic journaling that you're doing will go towards love, care and compassion. Mm. And your agami karma, your thought process will also start reducing. So by the end of your lifetime, you'll have a spoon rather than a bucket. Wonderful. Um, now, at this point, a lot of people out there watching might be contemplating to undergo past life regression. So it's very important here to, you know, for us to differentiate and for you to guide what kind of people and circumstances um, should really compel one to visit somebody like you for therapy? And who are the people you recommend stay out of past life regression completely? So somebody who has psychosis, schizophrenia, borderline personality disorder, bipolar, um, having active, let's say, delusion, hallucinations, they should not visit a past life regression therapist. It's going to be detrimental. Second, people who have legal problems with their siblings or parents or cousins should not visit a past life regression therapist because they're already forming like a metaphorical story in their mind that they are blameless. Hmm. So such people, it's a risk to come for a session because they may just uh, create a story which is untrue and then things are not going to work out for them. Hmm. So people have to be careful, especially therapists have to be careful not to take each and every client that calls them. Okay. And they must find out the case history. Why are they coming? What is the reason that they are coming? Let's say somebody who is, uh, whose spouse is having an extramarital affair. Okay. And she's disturbed. She's having like a nervous breakdown. She should not be taken. She should calm down first. At least six, eight months should go. And then maybe she can come for a session. Because when a client is in a blaming mode, the session will not work in hmm. the right way. Right. This is very important. These are the people who should not be taking a past life session. And who should be taking definitely people who have, let's say, kind of psychosomatic ailments, um, like fertility issues, migraine, asthma. Uh, repeated patterns in life? Yeah, like, re like repeated patterns in life. Have you come across any case where somebody has gone through their past life regression and regretted going there? I don't think in my practice anybody has regretted going there. Okay. Uh, because like I said, um, as, a, as, a, as a clinical person, we are taught how to take a case history to identify the core issue that the person is having and work with the core issue. 
Okay. So let us say, I'll give you an example how this is done. So let's say you call me, okay? And you say that uh, you're having some problems with a particular relationship. And you tell me that you feel lost, abandoned, uh, there's lack of love. Um, there is a feeling that uh, you're not being valued enough, okay? So I'm going to ask you about your childhood, let's say, okay? And then I'll ask you, like, do you, have you felt uh, not valued enough even when you were a child? So you'll tell me that, yeah, kind of, I'll ask you about your relationships with your parents, stuff like that, right? So I'll take down a little case history. And maybe I will point out to you that since you were a little child, looks like you are carrying some amount of unworthiness. Okay. So you'll say, yeah, I don't feel worthy enough. So it is possible that in the current relationship that you are in, it's because of the unworthiness that you are carrying since your childhood that this seems to have manifested. So let us probe about the un unworthiness rather than the relationship. Because you have to get out of that feeling so that the next person you attract in your life will make you feel worthy. So this is how the shift takes place. From being unworthy till the age of let's say 28, to leaving behind the unworthiness so that you don't attract the next person in your life who continues to make you feel unworthy. So this is how the shift has to take place. Wow. For those people who probably cannot visit a past life regression therapist, what are the signs that you, you feel that they should look out for? Um, just to, you know, just to live their life, the, you know, and go about their relationships in the correct way. You know, I can only say that past life therapy is not like mandatory for people to have, okay? Yeah. I think even without past life regression therapy, if you live your life with discipline, hmm. I think life can be much better. So I truly believe that... Um, Discipline is very important in life because discipline will teach you self-control. And if you learn self-control, then it's like living in a very meditative space. Yeah. So I feel discipline and self-control are the key factors if anybody wants to live a good life. So you know, I'll, I'll tell you a little a story, okay? So there was this grandfather and uh, he, had a, he was talking to his grandson. And he told his grandson that, son, there are two wolves that live inside of you. Uh, one is evil. It is anger, jealousy, greed, resentment, inferiority, lies, and ego. And the other wolf is the good wolf. And that is joy, peace, love, hope, humility, kindness, empathy, and truth. So the boy thought about it and then asked his grandfather, uh, which one wins? So the old man quietly replied, the one you feed. Oh, wow. That's an excellent answer. So what are we doing in our lives? You know, uh, well, how, how are we living our life? I think that itself will determine how your life is going to go. Absolutely. I know so many people out there. In fact, as we speak and converse, I know so many people out there who, you know, they are consciously wronging the other person. They know it, but maza aara hai. You know, they're just getting some thrill out of it. But that's the way they, they're going about their life without thinking about what's going to happen to them and their karma. So, you know, Pritika, there are three important areas, okay? One is you destroy negative karma or you destroy destructive actions, which many people do. Don't lie, don't steal, you know. But are we increasing our virtuous actions? Hmm. So you, you're not lying, but are you happy being truthful or are you actually trying to be truthful? Are you focusing on virtual actions, virtuous actions? That is important, correct? So most people, they will stop doing the wrong, but they don't increase doing the right. 
So then life is going to be difficult for them. I remember uh, there was this uh, family friend, no longer a friend. He once walked into our house and uh, I was like a teenager. And, you know, he was probably in his 30s at that time, early 30s. And he, you know, he literally was boasting about how many married women he's had an extramarital affair with, you know, and how he would visit them uh, behind the backs of their, her, their respective husbands mm -hmm. and have the affair and how, you know, every relationship was getting sour because it is going to eventually. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, what are you creating? You know, what kind of a karma are you creating? So, and I was like really amazed. How is he telling me all of that with so much of pride? This is called very complex karma. It's extremely complex. Past life regression therapy, the best part of it is, it removes from your heart hatred. Because these are such complex karmic relationships that um, it's very difficult for them to break away from these cycles. So they are repeatedly in that cycle. So this young man, you know, who's boasting about having affairs, he's, he doesn't even realize that he's in a cycle which is so detrimental to his own mental health. But uh, such people generally maybe go to a past life regression therapist when either they fall in love. <laughs> Actually, it's true. I I've had uh, people who have, you know, mm. who are in the cycle and then suddenly they fall in love so deeply with somebody and now they want to stop this behavior. And that's when they'll come to you. Yeah. So love is a great healer. The patterns that I have observed, even that love doesn't last. Am I right? Well, it depends, you know. Um, where are you in the junction of your life? Hmm. See, like you spoke about, let's say, prarabdh. Hai na? Prarabdh will not fructify when you are born. Hmm. Prarabdh will fructify at different junctions of your life. Okay. So, let us say if I am carrying a health issue. Hmm. It may fructify maybe when I am 20. Hmm. I'm carrying uh, anger as an issue. And I've been a calm person in my childhood. But suddenly when I take a job, my anger starts surfacing. And I have to deal with it. So, prarabdh is not, we are carrying. We are carrying all the stuff that we had to learn in my bag. I've kept it on my back. But every few years, I'm taking out one lesson to learn. Hmm. So, prarabdh will also fructify different times of your life. So, it is possible for this young man, let us say, till the age of 35, he was carrying this prarabdh. And he was in this cycle, this karmic cycle, not able the pattern, not able to get out of the pattern. But at 35, God said, okay, now enough. Now, you are going to fall so madly in love that you're going to have to leave behind this that you're carrying and begin your new life, which is the learning of your current life. Hmm. So maybe at 35, this man suddenly becomes a different person. We, we, we have the example of, let's say, an Angulimal from our Vedas, okay, who used to kill people and then take the little finger and make a necklace of it. Yeah? And what happened to him? A second, and he changed from Angulimal, he, he became a saint. Right. So it is possible that Prarabdh is driving you in one direction, hmm. right? Which is what you're carrying, the trauma that you're carrying. And then suddenly an age comes when everything changes. Do we also make uh, the, this choice uh, before we take birth that there will be a, a point where it will come to a standstill and I will get an opportunity to progress. Absolutely, absolutely. When Before we arrive in this world, there is a blueprint that we create, right? And we've also markers, right? There are certain milestones that we have set for ourselves. And you will realize that these milestones will come up. They will come up in your life, you know? Like um, people choose their vocation. But I think for me, the vocation chose me. <laughs> so, I mean, I was a typical clinical psychologist, therapist till the age of 38. At 38, 
things changed for me. How it changed, why it changed, uh, I, I, I have no idea why it changed, right? But it did. And everything in my life that I had learned till the age of 38, I had to see, I had to perceive it differently and look at it through a different lens. So something must have, I must have before my life in this current life, I must have made that as a milestone that this is when the change will come. Right. Okay. And maybe I went along with the change. Sometimes change comes and you don't go along with the change. That can also happen in people's life. And then you repeat it again. Right. But maybe in my life, that's exactly where the change came. I think uh, I can also relate to this because, um, you know, as an actor, uh, you are supposed to dress in a particular way. You're supposed to, you know, um, be glamorous mm. and all of that, which is something I could never get myself to do because I was so innately old school and conservative. And, uh, uh, but you, I had the acting skills, you mm. know. So it was always a dilemma for me. And, but I'm very glad that somewhere, I think my soul chose not to work, you know, when I was getting these offers, I was, I was choosing, no, this is not where I want to head. So let me compromise. Let me let go. It's okay. And I would say when I look back, I'm very happy about the decisions I've made because now I know that was not my path, you know, Correct. that was not my calling. Mm. And today when I'm doing spiritual podcasts, I feel so grounded because this is my calling. Mm. So and and also when people saw me on screen as an actor, they never got to know the real me. Correct. But today when I'm doing my own podcast, it's like they know me as the person I am, you know, my thought process, my thinking. So um, I can relate to that. I'm curious to know about the mother-in-law and daughter-in-law or the in-laws karma. Yeah. Uh, we kind of uh, tapped upon it also, mm. but is there any specific, uh, uh, like like an example you want to give us? So, um, when you get married, you have a second set of parents. Right. Okay. But you don't look at them as parents. That's the issue that people have. If you look at them as your parents, there will never be a problem. Mm. Because your parents scold you. They say mean things to you. They look after you. They maybe don't give you things that you want. In-laws do the same. So what is the difference between having a set of parents, biological parents, and those parents that you get after marriage? But obviously, it's difficult. So I had this lady who had done a session. And uh, she saw that in a previous lifetime, the mother-in-law of the current lifetime was her neighbor. And the lady's father and the neighbor were friends. But this girl did not want the neighbor to become her stepmother. So she created a lot of problems and she was not married. She was unmarried, living with the father. So the father, you know, complied with the daughter and said, okay, I'm not going to meet the neighbor, the woman, and it doesn't matter and all that. But the neighbor had a lot of anger towards this girl that because of her, she was unable to, you know, be with the man that she loved. So in the current lifetime, the neighbor has become the mother-in-law. Okay. Now she, this, this lady realized that that's the reason when the husband and she go out, the mother-in-law wants to accompany them. <laughs> so the mother-in-law accompanies them everywhere. So she said for the last 10 years that we've been married, not a single dinner we've had together without the mother-in-law, lunch without the mother-in-law, even when we go on trips, she will accompany us. So the neighbor now, as the mother-in-law, wants to control the situation. So what I'm trying to say is, if you have problems with your mother-in-law, it's a good idea to investigate and find out who was she in your previous lifetime and why is, what is the reason why she seems to be controlling your husband. Hmm. Because once you understand that, no, you may uh, look at your mother-in-law differently. What was the most like crazy or weirdest case that you ever come across, which was like really surprising that can it, this also happen? There are so many of them, but 
I think one case uh, was really like I do have I do get cases where they have you know kind of validation. So this is very important. You know, after a past life session, if you get some kind of validation, it kind of makes you believe that. And when you believe something, healing is faster also. So one of the cases that I had recently, I think it was last year in November, um, which was of a young man from Delhi. And he saw himself as uh, Iltutmish, okay. who came from uh, the Middle East. And then eventually he came to India. And he is the one who completed the Qutub Minar. Okay. And the session was fascinating. Uh, because uh, this young man had what we call a kinesthetic session. Means he was moving in the session. Okay. So if he, if he said to me that uh, I'm feeling tired, then he would actually bend while he was talking to me. And he was this person, I mean, the whole story of Il Tutmish is that, you know, he traveled through the desert with the army and stuff like that. So it was deserted and there was no water. So he would ask me in the session for water. So he was given water to drink. So in the session, he was drinking water also. And he had 18 glasses of water without coming out of the state of hypnosis. And I was worried that he's going to want to go to the washroom because of drinking so much of water. And when I asked him, why are you drinking so much of water? He said, in the desert. So he was going through the experience while he was also interacting with me, also drinking water. So what was Iltutmish like in this lifetime? Well, he's a young man, married, having uh, two children. And he has a big problem uh, because he's not able to get along with his father, which was also the case then. And uh, also he, why did he come to see me was because in this lifetime, he's born in a very wealthy family, but he's not able to enjoy the wealth. So he travels by bus, he travels by metro in Delhi. And he says, I don't know why I'm doing this. And he said, when I'm traveling, I constantly... I'm sending this feeling to all the people around me, please forgive me. And he said, I need to ask for forgiveness from lakhs of people. So I travel in uh, public transport so I can keep saying, please forgive me, please forgive me, please forgive me. And he said, I'm not able to enjoy all the money I have. I can travel in a Mercedes car, but I can't because I'm carrying this burden in my heart and I feel that my hands are filled with blood. And after the session, now, of course, it's been quite some time now, he's going in his car and he's happier and he is uh, feeling at peace. So this is a very interesting kinesthetic session that I had. I don't think in my 35 years of practice I've ever had somebody who asked me to drink 18 glasses of water in a session. So for me, that was quite something. And uh, um, one more thing I wanted to ask you was, mm. if people are interested to become um, a past life regression therapist like you are, um, what, what are the protocols? See, anybody with an intention can become a past life regression therapist. Okay. okay. And even I have students of mine, they've been typical housewives okay, looking after their family, but they got attracted to this uh, therapy and they came and they studied. So anybody can become a therapist, but you become a, you can become a good therapist or a great therapist. Hmm. That's the difference, right? You can become a good therapist with your training and, and doing sessions. And you can only become a great therapist if you have discipline, you have uh, integrity and ethical behavior. And you have to at least do 500 cases. And you should also be destined to be one. Yeah, maybe. But yes, you have to at least do 500,000 cases because then you will get an idea about the therapy, about the suggestions that you have to give while we are doing the therapy and how the closure has to be done. Because if you see one patient in a month, 
what are you going to get experience? Zero, right? So to become a great therapist, you have to be passionate about the work. There are many people in the, in the world who are doing this work, but there are many also who are doing other things. Like they are past life regression therapists, they are doing tarot, they are doing uh, you know numerology, they are doing astrology, they are doing Reiki. So I have many people who have cards, okay, <laughs> which have lots of things written on them. Huh? That cannot work. Jack of all trades, master. You of cannot that. be a master if you are not committed to the work that you do. Even a doctor, for that matter, like a surgeon who is doing six surgeries in a day is a specialist. So to become a specialist, you have to be committed, devoted, dedicated and passionate about your work. Otherwise, you cannot become, like you cannot be remembered. Amazing. So uh, we'll end this session with one karmic message from you uh, to my audience. Um, if I've already had the, one of the best podcasts ever um, in the studio. So one karmic message. The karmic message uh, to everybody is that everybody wants to be self-realized. People come to me and say, ma'am, I want to be self-realized. I don't want to come back in this lifetime. So to all people out there, I'm going to just say two statements which I hold close to me. One is I tell, I tell people, see yourself by yourself. That means see what you are doing by yourself. Nobody can teach you that. So it's important to meditate over your actions, over your thoughts and over your deeds. Because if you're able to do that, you can definitely see yourself the way you are. And then change can come to you. And of course, the chapter 6 of the Bhagavad Gita, verse number 5, which says, lift yourself by yourself. It's only you who can make a difference to your life. Nobody else can. So once you understand these two beautiful statements, I think you can live a better life. And you have to be more mindful of what you do, what you say, what you think, how you feel for others and yourself. So don't put yourself down. Okay, lift yourself. Because if you lift yourself, you will see the opposite person in a different way. Right. So I really truly believe that compassion, love, care, concern, consideration of others is very important in life. And don't worry about what people think about you. Is it, is it really important, uh, according to you, to, you know, like openly declare forgiveness to people around you? Like you said, this guy, he feels that I'm, you know, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It, he might not be saying it standing in the bus, but it's just a feeling. Yes. But is it also necessary to physically say a sorry, according to you? Well, sometimes I think it's important to say sorry. Because what happens is when you physically say sorry, you're breaking your own ego. So that really helps. And um, more than forgiveness, I believe in compassion. You know, the more compassionate you are, for human beings belonging to any caste and creed, I think you can become a better person. Wow. On that beautiful note, I end today's podcast thanking you so much once again for being here. Thank you. Uh, and enlightening us uh, with this beautiful session. Um, as I said before, I do spiritual and astrology podcasts and we've trended astrologer interviews in 2024 on this very channel. So subscribe. Uh, lots of love. Thank you.